So you can see I've got the TIS MFT Pro all set up. I've got my leads here. I've been through the zeroing process. This test is really handy that you've got the help menu. So if you are struggling with what to do in your lead positions and how to zero it, get all that information and then again, testing the circuit. Now with this one, we need to make sure our continuity of conductors is correct. And we're gonna pretend I've brought this circuit straight down into this board. As you've seen, there is an isolator switch up there. But we'll ignore that because I'd have to be up the steps messing about with the probes. And this is an easier way to demonstrate how you go about doing your continuity testing. I will pop a picture up here somewhere in the shot which shows me shorting out the um, cabling at the origin of this. Um, so again, you could do that at either end because essentially we're just testing this final circuit rather than the whole installation. And that'll make more sense when you see us doing the insulation resistance tests. But for the minute, I've shorted out between... Um, L1 and the CPC. Now if I test between those two parts I should get a value of resistance and then we need to repeat that process between L2, L3 and neutral and this should all be roughly speaking the same. So I'll run through that process now. I'm not going to disconnect the earthing at this end. We're going to class it as all part of the same system um, and when we come to our value of ZS later on this would be ZDB point of note it wouldn't be um, a ZE value because we're not at the origin again. But if I go on these probes, so I want to get onto the earth and onto L1. I could do that with a clip. Easier. So I'm going to clip onto the earth bar just in this corner. So we're on there now. If I then pop this onto L1 and press to test, Remember where my buttons are. Uh, ah, I haven't switched the isolator on. That's the first fail. <laughs> we'll get that right this time. If I pop it onto the L1 and hit the test value, we should get a measurement of resistance. And you can see we have, we've got 0 0.20. So I'll go and swing that linking wire over now, and then we'll repeat that process through these three. You'll see me zoom that through on the footage just now. Seen me run through that process now and we've got roughly 0 0.20, 0 0.21 I think one of the um, phases popped up, I think it was the L2, but roughly speaking we're about the same which is a good sign because that means our cable's generally intact and it's important you do this with the jumpers on individually not all together so don't just clamp all of your um, L1, 2, 3 and neutral together and stick them to earth, you need to do them one at a time and then make sure as an extra check that you've got no continuity um, say you had your L1 and your CPC joined together, that there isn't any continuity to L2, L3 or neutral, which I've done. So I know now, in terms of a dead test, from the point of view of continuity, we're okay. We've got the CPC straight down here, and it's not appearing to be um, connected to any of the line conductors, and the same in reverse and between each other. So they're all testing clear. And that means we're in a, a safe position to now approach the second dead test, which is actually a live test as well, in my opinion, and that's the insulation resistance test. And this one's a little bit different for your um, three-phase systems. So I'm going to have a look at guidance note three, and we'll go through that before we dive into it. Okay, so before we go on to the insulation resistance test, I thought we'd have a look in guidance note three, brown edition. And in particular, it's page 71. So when we're talking about insulation resistance testing on a simple install, you can do it at the origin. You can check the whole system as a whole. Um, but with this, because it's, it's not really a complex one, but it is subdivided with distribution circuits, and that's the terminology this book uses. So you can break it down into smaller parts, and that's really to try and stop the culmination of lots of circuits and distribution boards dragging your overall value of insulation resistance down. Wouldn't be a factor here, but it could be out in a real um, installation rather than a simulated one. So keep that in mind. And when it's talking about your insulation resistance test on a three-phase circuit, I mean, this is talking about a four-core power cable, but it's the same principle. They're using the armorings of the CPC. We've actually got a core of the cable as well. Um, but your test process is pretty much the same. Um, it says here that we also need to be checking this at first fixed stage. So we need to be doing an insulation resistance test when the cabling's installed. Obviously, 
in a bigger, more complex installation, that can be months apart. So it's really important that you do do that to make sure that there's been no issue of the cable getting snagged at first fix stage because it's a lot easier to put right then than later on. And then you've got your process here. It's um, table 2.10. It's a five test process. So you've got L1 to L2, L1 to L3, L2 to L3, and what L1, L2, and L3 together to neutral, and then L1, 2, 3, and neutral together to earth. There is a caveat to that on the next page, as there often is with the regs and guidance notes. We know how it goes. Um, but it says here that for experienced inspectors and testers, table 2.11 shows how it's possible to reduce the number of steps down to four. However, should any of those tests yield reading lower than what's in table 2.9, we'll have a look at that in a sec, it'll be necessary to follow the sequence stated in the table we just looked at so you can identify which conductors are affected. So basically this method gives you a, a clear value, so off the scale measurement, then you're not going to have any issues between any of your conductors, but if you get a value that isn't quite right, you would need to repeat the five step process on the other page. And this gives you a diagram looking at what it wants you to do, essentially. So you're testing between your cores and your CPC and the process and order that this dictates. And we'll do that on this board um, in a second. And it talks about here um, looking at stuff that can be damaged during your insulation resistance test. So you need to be mindful of that. And really it's on about um, things like AFDDs, surge protectors, any contactors, digital controls. With this, we do have an SPD at the origin, but I've turned it off. It's on an MCB at the minute, so we're at risk of um, SPD and surges, but the whole installation's isolated, so no great dramas. Um, so that's isolated at present, and we can make sure we're not getting any spurious values or damaging anything, because other than that, there's nothing between either ends from A to B. Okay, so with this test, there's a move of the probes in the MFT Pro um, Plus. So we've had to move across to the um, earth side because we're measuring between L and PE. It's saying here, but if we switch that to, you know, you can do live, neutral, and protective earth together. So if you look at this now, you can use your three probes if you press the help menu. Um, it shows you how to do that. Sorry three conductors at the same time. Uh, if you scroll through the options it even dictates how you can do that on a three-phase system. You can see here using linking wires um, so you can do it all at once. But we're going to do them one at a time because as I said we're going to assume this is a much larger more complex installation and we're just testing this one final circuit. But it is handy that you get that there. Um, but we'll stick to just the two cables there and again if you want you can adjust it and set all of your timings up yourself within the test set but we're just going to leave it all on auto um, and it will look after itself. So first up we'll go between our L1 and L2 so that's a nice easy first step make sure they're in there and you've got a good contact hit the test button you can see we're at 500 volts and we should measure clear we're off the scale it's applied 517 volts and we're fine so our next one is L1 to L3, so again, probes in, you'll know I've popped some gloves on, although it's a de dead test, it is still applying voltage, so cover the basics off, I hate to see people working inside boards where there is electrical energy without gloves at the very least, you can see we're clear again off the scale, and if we check L2 to L3, so it's the two middle two in this case, and again hit test, and again we're off the scale, which is nice, um, and that's the ones that are separated apart from each other, so we now need to do L1, L2 and L3 together between neutral. Um, so you can join them together at this end or the other end, I'm just going to zoom off to the other end and put them all in a little uh, crop clip arrangement so they're connected together and I'll come back and take that measurement at this end in just a second. Okay, so they're joined together now at the other end of this arrangement. I've not moved the camera backwards and forwards. I will keep popping little clips up of the other end. It's literally the other end of the warehouse and I'll be chasing myself backwards and forwards. So a little picture of that setup and we can now check that we've got this done correctly at this end. And we need to make our measurement between neutral and these. So basically if you go on any of the other ones, they're all joined together at the other end. So it's the same, they're linked out. And we're checking those to neutral 
and we can see that that's clear as we would want. And then there's the one final test where we need to put all four of these together and check to the earth. So I'll go and add the neutral into my link up at the origin side and then we'll take that measurement to earth here. So again, we can drop onto any of these. I'm going to go onto the neutral. Uh, I'll use an earth clip because that's a bit far apart to get my fingers onto. So we'll zoom that on there. Again, any one of these, pop it on the neutral. And again, we're measuring off the scale. So we've done that five step process. We didn't shortcut it and go for four because I couldn't find a skilled inspector who's competent and knows what he's doing. So we've done it the basic way and that's all clear. So we now know we've got our continuity of conductors. We've got the cable down to this end where there is insulation resistance between all live conductors, neutrals and the CPC. And we know we're in a safe position to energize this circuit. So I'll go and make sure everything's put back together properly at the other end and then we'll come down here and have a look at some live testing which will involve some extra elements of PPE and we'll go through that in just a minute. Okay so you can see I've got a bit of extra PPE on, I've not put the outer leathers on, I've just got the inner rubbers. I've got my little art flash helmet with its shield. It's over the top for the incident energy that's down here, I know this because I've run these calculations through Modesoft Electrical OM which has the bolt on for the arc flash studies. So you can do that as part of your software and you know exactly what kind of PPE you might need. But if this was a much bigger switch room, you could have to wear full overall suits. You've seen these guys walking around in, and girls in what looks like your hazmat kits. So they're out there working inside live panels. And obviously, if at all possible, remove the live working element. Now in this case, and I've made this point lots of times, it's really important that we are verifying that this earth path is in place after all of those other prior tests and also it includes all of the other components in this circuit now energized. You know, you've got your RCD, your MCBs, we've got this mains operated switch up here for us to lock off the supply down to these booths. You could have contactors, digital controls, all these things that can switch in after the power's been energized can now help us determine what the actual loop impedance path is. And we'll see how that plays out again in the maths. We often do that on the channel with some of these testing experiments. Um, and we need to verify what our Ka value is down here. And that's between our live conductors, because obviously we're three phase and also um, to earth because they're different with the PFC and PSC. And we can see what our ZDB is between all of those live conductors as well. And it's a different process of tests as we work along. But belts and braces, I want it to be as safe as possible. I'll zoom you back in and we'll run through the process. The leads swap over again on the MFT Pro. You've got the help menu should you need it, which runs through different setups for your wires based on the three phase and single phase aspect. I've got my GS38 probes on. I have got some extenders as well that I could use, but to be honest, in this application, I'm quite happy with the rubber gloves and these. I mean, these boards are generally fairly safe to work within anyway. We've got the four pole isolator. It's currently switched off. So I know that there's no electrical energy anywhere inside this installation, um, this board that's open at present. I've got an appropriate level of PPE and I can go off and make these measurements now. And I'm going to start by checking between the live conductors. So that's between L1 and L2, L1 and L3, L2 and L3 and L1 and L3. And just to see what values we get between all of those, um, mainly for the PSC value. So we'll do that now. So I've already, already selected between phases here on the test instrument. You can see it's measuring 429 volts. If I hit test, we're going to get a measurement. So we've got 0 0.38 ohms between those two phases and an ISC of just over a kiloamp. So we can now go on to measure between L1 and L3. We go back to the prior menu. See, so we've got voltage again. Repeat the test. Oh, hold it down a bit longer. This is the thing with the PPE, it gets in the way. Uh, and you see a similar kind of measurement, which is great. Uh, we'll go back again. And now we need to do between L2 and L3. You see, we've got voltage again. Hit test. 
Same on the value again. So they're all pretty consistent between the live conductors. We've got roughly over one kiloamp measured um, between those. So now we can check between our lives and the earths and the lives and the neutrals. So your phases and neutrals, phases and earths. So we need to adjust the settings in the test instrument to see if it works with these big rubber gloves. So we'll have to swap this down now onto um, line and neutral, which we can do. Uh, leave it in standard configuration. You can see all the different options in there. Um, if you were working on an IT system, perhaps with a checkbox in between, you can even select that. You've got your no trip function as well. So if the RCD starts interfering with things and operating, you can go to no trip. We'll try a line and neutral uh, in standard mode. So again, we're in the neutral and the line terminals, and we're now going to take a measurement um, between the neutral and the different phases. So we'll start that off. Face shield back down, probes in hand, pop those in. And you can see we've got a single phase voltage now as we'd expect, we can hit test. And you can see we've got a measurement of 0 0.32 and 718 amps. We can come off now and go on to the L2 phase, hit test. Similar kind of value, which is great. And lastly, on L3. Again, got that input voltage at a single phase level. And another similar value. So note that the ISC is much lower than between the two phases because this instrument does the calculation itself. So there's the rule of thumb within the guidance note three where you would double your value. So if we've measured this at a single phase arrangement only just line to neutral, you'd then double that to give you an approximate PSC, which would be roughly 1.2, 1.3 kA, which is above what we've actually measured. So it's erring on the side of caution with that rule of thumb. But now we need to switch over and do between live and protective earth. Um, it may end up needing to into no trip on this, but we'll give it a whirl. So with this one, we can clamp onto the earth bar as I've done. Face shield back down, and you can see it's asked for the probe to be moved to protective earth. So we'll do that. And we're now on that, and I can stick my line probe back in to L1 and see we've got a single phase voltage we hit test hold it down long enough and you hear there the RCDs operated and that's what I was expecting it would do so we're going to need to set this up in the no trip configuration and run through that test so I'll just go restore power to the RCD we'll get this set up ready so if we go into this we need to stick it onto no trip 30 milliamp and hit OK and we're going to have to swap to a three lead test. OK, so we've quickly done that. It's asking for us to probe onto neutral, which I'll do first. And obviously it will start at L1. We'll get those in. We should start to see a voltage between line and neutral. Put that lead out of the way, you'll be able to see. Easier said than done in massive rubber gloves. <laughs> We've got between line and neutral and line and air, 247 volts. If I hit test, it shouldn't upset the RCD this time. Test takes a little bit longer because the instruments, I think it does three tests and then it provides the average of those to give its value. It takes a little bit of time to think about it and it should come up with something. You can see it's fairly consistent with what we've kind of got um, between the line and neutrals. And that's because this is a TNCS install. So you would expect them to be reasonably similar. And our sub-main down here, all the conductors are the same size. So we've got 0 0.33 and 529 amps. It's a little bit lower on the PFC. You see a little bit higher with the measurement. Um, and that's most likely just due to the length of the cabling within the distribution boards. So as I say, at the origin, the earth is ever so slightly longer than um, the final conductors. Basically the board's the same at the other end, so they would come in and terminate in this RCD, but the earth's running down into this bar here. We've also got um, the earth cabling within the isolator at the other end too, where it runs through and it's a little bit longer. So it all just adds to the impedance ever so slightly, and that's why you see 
that tiny difference. But we'll repeat it now for L2 and L3. See the voltage is present again. Again, it's thinking about it, taking those three little measurements, and then it'll produce an average for us. Uh, I, I think it is three. I'm saying it with confidence that it might be true. So on this one, you can see a little bit different. So we're 0.34 and 0.40, but it's marginal. And obviously, these have a wide tolerance on the test instrument different terminations running through the isolators. There's lots of different things at play. It's not going to mirror out precisely the same. You're just looking for it to be consistent. And then lastly, between L3 and neutral, So you can see it's running through that process again. This is just to give us the last check and we should get a value between L3 and um, protective earth. Sorry, not neutral. So although we've got the neutral conductor on, we are actually checking it to the earth largely. It's given us the value between neutral as well, just as a byproduct of the way the test works. But we've already got what I would class as more accurate measurements for that by doing it on the Nurtrip method. You can see here again 0.37 ever so slightly higher again you've got the probes the tiny little probes going onto the contacts of the screw heads it will move about and um, you can repeat it if you want and see if you get a, a different value attaching the probes again but i'm happy with those very consistent um, and again it just emphasizes that the measurement between your live conductors the instruments done that calculation itself based on a direct measurement so you know exactly what your psc is down at this um point of point of use um, and again I'm demonstrating all of the testing from this end of the circuit you would take your measurements for the continuity testing usually at the main distribution board I've just done them from this end because I've got the camera set up so if you're expecting to see different parts of the install for different parts of the testing it really is just easier to set the camera up like this and I've run through various different other videos on testing anyway we can look now to test the RCD so let's do that one Okay, so first up is the setup of the instrument. So you can see here it's given us option just to run an auto sequence, but you can do an auto sequence and a ramp test as well. Um, so we've done that. We're also going to do the 0 and 180 degree um, nominal values. So if we hit tick, and these gloves are pretty decent actually that they're working through the screen. And we need a three probe setup again. So we need to be on protective earth, neutral, and the line. And I'll repeat this test three times. So I will do it across all of the three phases just to make sure the RCD up front operates. But I might not show that on camera. Right, so we'll get into the RCD test now. I've got a helper at the other end to help reset. But I'm going to hit the test button. First up, it runs through the ramp test. And it should go out. So it's done that. We're going to restore the power now. And then it'll go on to the 180 degree phase. And you can see it's taken that out a little bit lower. 16 and a half milliamps. That's slightly on the low slide. we we'll carry on with the test. We're now into the one times, 29 milliseconds. Next one again, 17 and again, seven and again, 13. And now we've got our half times for the last test. And these should measure off scale because it's only half times. And there we have it. So we've got, an RCD that's working. We've measured it from this end of the circuit. You could measure it at the input side. And obviously you can repeat this test between all of the three phases as well. So you can repeat it on L2 and L3 and it should map out to a similar value. Um, I'm not gonna do that because it's gonna irritate my helper who would have to stand there resetting this RCD over and over again. Um, but I will do it off camera. So obviously just to verify that all of the phases are operating the RCD. Okay, so just the last look at guidance note three. It's the RCD uplift element, so if you are encountering a higher value of ZS than you would expect during the course of your testing, there is a known phenomenon between some brands of RCDs and some test instruments where it can add half an ohm or more to some of the values. You can um, raise awareness of that yourself on the install if you measure at the load and supply sides of the RCD, it'll give you a rough approximation of what's going on internal to that. 
it's just a measurement of impedance or a phantom measurement of impedance between um, the device and the testing instrument. A lot of them are modern test instruments now factor that in and are pretty accurate regardless of that. A lot of the RCD manufacturers have kind of moved away from some of the older tech that was causing more of an issue. Um, so it's not something that you will encounter all of the time, but it's definitely something to consider. And again, just to zoom back into Guidance Note 3, it does feel very single phase centric, I've got to say, Guidance Note 3 these days. And the RCD test, it's looking at a single phase installation in the demonstrations, but it shows you the two lead and three lead setups. Um, there is also the measurement now that isn't, strictly speaking, so detailed as it once was. So if you are measuring your RCD trip times, for example, you don't need to go through the process as we would have used to. In this particular scenario, because I'm demonstrating it for a video and because it's going to be in a booth used by people who may be in a learning phase, I want to be absolutely sure that this is working as well as possible. And obviously, if one of the tests I'd done didn't quite come to the values that um, would be anticipated. I would look into the literature from the manufacturer of the RCD involved, in this case Proteus, and see if they had different requirements in terms of testing it um, for operation. Because some of the RCDs, I think they need 250 milliamps injected as opposed to what the test sequence actually applies. Um, and it's not as black and white as it seems. And to kind of remove that from um, the aspect of us out on site, where it's very difficult to replicate product standard testing, the regs have simplified things now so we don't have to go to the extremes we would have used to have had to have done. But I've done it here, and again, repeating the process across the phases, you can see it's quite labour intensive. If you're out on site with a board full of RCBOs, and you go in between point A and point B, trying to get the, the values and figures you need, it can be quite labour intensive. So the fact that the regs allow for a different process of testing, it's acceptable. You can use that, so reference into Guidance Note 3 and BS7671 if you want to find more information out about that as well. Okay, you can see in the table here where it's talking about the RCD testing. If you have got um, an RCD which is 30 milliamps or less, you can set it to type AC and do the five times testing or 250 milliamps. I've just discussed it should operate in 40 um, milliseconds if non-delayed or 150 if time delayed. If it's a type AC RCD, you do it on one times, and again, um, you've got it up there to tell you when it should operate. So it's just slight differences within the table, and as you move down, it tells you about RCDs that are greater than 30 milliamps, um, RCDs that might be harmonized to a different standard with the notes in the bottom about those standards, so it's well worth checking out. And you even get your table here, which tells you which RCDs are which, based on the markings on the front of them. So I hope you enjoyed that run through of some testing and also installing this submain down to these booths. We can now get some power on down here and make sure we're safe. That's been the primary objective. Power's now isolated at the intake, because that's why I've taken the PPE off. Just a point of reference, you've got your guidance note three. There is also the test and inspection book from Napit, which I'll drop in the description of this video. That's another really good one that sets out how to approach testing and inspecting um, in good detail. But yeah, this is really the Bible to your testing inspection. So make sure you do check out Guidance Note 3. Don't be relying on me for instructing and preparing you for any 2391 and your AM2 assessments. GSH and Gary Hayes have got some awesome content in and around all of that already. I just wanted to quickly run through and speak about some of the important aspects of doing the testing. It's obviously really careful um, in the way you approach it. So make sure you do do your dead testing first that you're making sure all of your conductors are in the right configuration and order so that when you come to do your live testing and even your insulation resistance testing that you're in the best possible shape to get the right outcome. And when you're um, starting your ZS measurements, understanding that you can calculate them if you want. So I could have used an inquired value of ZE. I could have used my R1, R2 measurements. I could have added those two values together to come to a figure of ZS. However, if I'd done that, I wouldn't have the verification down at this end that somebody coming to use this equipment and work on it was in a safe condition. In my opinion, that is fudging and bending the rules around working live to suit a narrative of de-skilling. I think it's an honour as electricians to ensure that systems are safe for people to use. And while we can keep ourselves safe to do that, it's really important that we take that on board. So this isn't me trying to preach to industry about what we should be doing, far from it. But it's just my own approach to this in having been an electrician now for 25 years. I want to ensure that users of a system 
uh, in the safest possible circumstance to operate and use it. I could have made a mistake during the course of dead testing and put a conductor into the wrong terminal or done something silly and stupid. This could then be energised and at no point would somebody be aware of the potential danger of that and yet all the certificates could be filled in to say everything was absolutely fine. Unlikely I know but not impossible. And we also have the added, added issue of extra impedance that's added to circuits through things like this isolator that's up there which once energised can behave slightly differently when we're going through RCDs and MCBs I've shared on my channel before the consequences of a high impedance MCB might not be picked up through the process of dead testing you're only going to see that in energized conditions and while your mfts will vary in tolerance and produce spurious values sometimes i've shown again that generally as long as you're not right up close to where the transformer is or close to the intake in your premises those values are pretty consistent and accurate and it gives you a real overview and insight into the work that's on the wall and in the fabric of the building and for those people who are going to be making use of it so yeah that's my approach with it and again operating the rcds with the test buttons do all the basics make sure you're functionally testing your installation as well i've not fully shown that on this video but it's another important aspect there are other tests you can delve into such as your phase sequencing point of note it's very different to phase rotation don't get the two mixed up um, your volt drop measurements you can look at some power factor as well so you could go more in depth on this if you want and maybe we'll revisit that in the future but for the minute i think we've verified down to this point at the very least we're in a good, safe, consistent setup for people who are going to come into this area to do work. Um, you know, with solar, battery storage, EVs, there are aspects of being around live components during the course of that. We can also set up some demonstrations of live testing as well. Um, and we want to know exactly what condition the installation is at to this point. Obviously, our circuits out of here again are going to need checking in the same way we've done already. So we replicate that process. And that's where your installation builds from being a simple um simple installation to a more complex one so again factoring that in with some of the test processes i hope you found this useful if you've got any questions please do drop them in the comments below i know sharing content around testing will trigger some people i probably put a probe in the wrong place at the wrong time so relax a little bit on that um, it's not the end of the world it's just what goes on out on site every day people don't follow a step-by-step -step literary and itinerary of what they should be doing they work through knowledge and experience in a safe and consistent way that works for them there is no set step by step you should do this you should do that that's out there there's just guidance and people come to their own conclusions alongside their experience and using stuff like the test instruments which is what i've done today please drop your comments in below get involved in the discussion on social media and i will see you on the next one